Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Donald Burns, executive career coach, and this special edition of Crash Course is about the cover letter. A lot has changed in the last 18 months. People are confused. I can sort of. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Part. This is Michelle Ricklin from the National Career Summit and SelfGrowth.com. We've had really wonderful interviews with practical information, and today we are fortunate to have a great guest with us speaking about a very important topic in the job and career market. Why cover letters are dead. Oh, thank you very much, Michelle. It's a real pleasure to be here. Great. Are cover letters really dead? Well, you know, that's a little bit provocative. Um, <laughs> I would say their traditional cover letters are on life support. <laughs> they're not totally dead, but um, they're on their way out, and they're being replaced by other forms. Ninety percent of what I call the traffic you know, between people uh, engaged in a job search and employers and recruiters. Ninety percent of that traffic happens uh, via an email with, an with a resume. Its basic cover letter has morphed into the body text of an email with a resume attachment. And there are some new things, 2002, say. People sent stuff through the mail, resumes and letters. Probably around 2005, the cover letter <laughs> kept shrinking in importance, and basically it morphed into the body text of the email. And that's where it is now for, for most of the uh, correspondence. The, the cover letter is really the body text of an email in most cases, and sometimes called an e-note. The cover letter has now become part of, of the email. Um, how, how different is it? is it? Is it written differently because it's an email? Of course, let's just say, and I, I said it's not all, all email. There are exceptions. I'll get into a little later. Some important exceptions. But let's just say, and also if, for example, on a, on a site, they will actually ask you to upload a cover letter, just like the old days. So that, that may be. But, you know, for real correspondence, yes, it's a uh, email. And the email has two forms. You know, you could go plain text or a little fancier, you can go HTML. You can actually add some uh, styling, some graph. question is, will it get through? In all cases, it really has to be shorter. And I think here you really have to pay attention to word count. You know, my ballpark is what people can stand. And I think about 300 words. That's okay. a long email, actually. About 300 words. Maybe if, you know, if you have something so good, you might go a little longer than that, maybe 400 words. That's a lot of text, four or 500 words. And in that case, I tell people, look, they have a lot of text there. It's not bad, but break it up with subheadlines. Headlines. People forget to do that. In other words, they just send out these long blocks of text. Very hard to read. You can get away with a longer email, but what I do, and say if it's just plain text, and I can't use bold, and I can't use any fancy formatting, I make a headline or capital letter, and that'll break it up, and that'll get by. So that is different. Whereas an ordinary letter, a little more difficult, there's less patience. HTML, similar idea to a printed letter, but to look at that thing on the screen and look at much more quickly. I think I want to rewind a little bit and let's let's just talk about what is the what was the original purpose of the traditional cover letter? Long time ago, back to the caveman days. The purpose of the cover letter, as people said, was to entice the reader to take a look at the resume. So the idea of the cover letter originally was a teaser. That look, before we get into the, the resume, this big thing, we just want a, a little teaser letter. Also, that cover letter was also used for information above and beyond what would be appropriate for a resume. For example, somebody might have special requirements about relocation, uh, some preference, money topics. The idea was that if you had some special information over and above, you would put that in the cover letter. All that has really gone away. I'll tell you why. In a tell us the intent of, of this, you know, new, uh, yeah. new development. All right. We're all out of time. That's what's really happened. We just, we just basically compressed, compressed the poor cover letter into, into a, a shadow of its former self. There's no time to, to digest all this cover letter and resume. 90% of the cases, you can't send a blank email. So the cover letter is somewhat pro forma. 300 words, right, a little intro, personalized intro, very important, but not a lot. Uh, maybe some highlights from the resume, a couple of bullet points. I'd be very pleased if we could get together for an interview. That's a little bit pro forma, meaning there's not a pro forma, meaning a little bit of a template. Most of the time, because people, 
if there's anything important, it has to be in the resume and not on that, that email. People get to the resume and they want to take a look at that and that's what they decide on. Most cases probably, the question is often asked, look, do people even read the cover letter, this new thing, this, this email? Some people do. Uh, I think it's probably 50-50. Nobody really knows. If you do it really well and with a really bold headline, if it catches somebody's eye, they'll certainly read it. You can certainly count that if your resume gets through, somebody or, or a machine or somebody, somehow that's going to be processed. But not necessarily that cover letter. It might very well be stripped out. Now, a lot of people will take their resume and send it to an employer by email or upload it into an employer's website. Mm -hmm. And they'll put that, that short and brief um, email together in, for that purpose. But then they uh -huh. also will send a hard copy to an employer. And do you recommend then having the traditional cover letter that goes along with that? Or just, uh, you know, an overview of that, that you would put in the email? That's a very good idea to send it using both ways. Because frankly, we all know these job boards can be uh, somewhat of a black hole. You know? Absolutely. I don't believe they trust it. And if it's a, I would say if it's a high priority opportunity for the person, then absolutely send it two ways. I recommend this all the time. The challenge is finding who to send it to, not HR. You want to get it to somebody in the, in the, in the operational or the hiring chain, number one. And you want to find out where that person is physically. That's not so simple anymore. If I'm really trying to make an impression, and this is very effective, I, want, I don't want to use regular mail. I recommend priority mail because it's relatively cheap still, and it comes in a, in a flat, this is in the U.S., by the way, U.S. priority mail, a flat mailer, almost like DHL or FedEx. It looks official. It's relatively cheap. It's, it, when it was five bucks, I, I think the rates have just gone up. And that will make an impression, and nobody will dare throw that out as junk mail or in the garbage. That looks too official. So it'll get, that'll help get it through. This is something that's really high priority. And if it's so high priority, you send it that way, then the cover letter, yeah, it's not only, it's not only some summary and some points, you really want to show that you've researched the company, explain why you're contacting them. In other words, this is a little bit of a, almost a proposal. So that type of letter, very effective, but you have to know, you know, who the recipient is, and you have to do some research, and you have to send it in a high-priority medium. You could even do that. It could be overseas. A client of mine is trying to uh, contact a competitor. He works for a big software company, and he knows the name of the person, cannot physically figure out where this person is. Well, we're going to send it to his uh, headquarters. You know, he's kind of the dress of record. We know he's not really there. So I said that this formal-looking important looking DHL or priority mail will get through one way or another. They're not going to throw that out. And of course we do the regular route too. Go onto the company's website. But it's just too easy to get lost and um, too much going on behind the scenes with those systems. It's an important opportunity. You don't want to hang your future on something you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So do you really think that the recruiters and the hiring managers pay attention to the cover letter? You know, it, think, some people I say that, you know, it. they trash the, some people just say that they trash the letter, they save the resume. Um, what's your view? If it looks like it's easy to read, that is key. If it doesn't look like a lot of work, they'll glance over it. And if you do it correctly, if you have a provocative headline or something interesting that jumps off the page, they'll look at it. I don't think it, it'll, I mean, but if anything is really important, it's got, it's got to be in the resume, too. Because it's nice, say, all right, I'm looking at the letter, that's, uh, the email, uh, it's a little bit impressive, that's nice. Whatever that was impressive, that better be in the resume, too, because the resume will get through the rest of the process. The email, you, you can't be sure. Also, I don't want to make it, uh, <clears throat> downplay it too much, because if you do the reverse, you know, if you just send a, an email, and if that thing is not even customized, right, if it's just like some kind of boilerplate uh, copy and paste with no customization, I'm only talking about a line or two of customization at the time, but that is, is not effective at all. 
sometimes you're forced to do that because you don't even know who the who the who's on the other end. You don't have a name. You might not even have a company. It might be a blind recruiting type of an ad. In that case, you just have to go with pure pro forma, kind of a ten. Uh, I, and by the way, you say, well, then how do you start it? How do I do? I say, dear Miss, dear Mister. <laughs> I say, look, if you don't even know who's getting it, I start them off with uh, good morning <laughs> with an exclamation point. Because in the direct mail world, you know, it's been known for a while, that is one of the most universally uh, popular greetings. And they say, how do we know it's morning? It's always morning somewhere in the world. Give them a good morning. But that's, that's hard. And I, I say, in that case, look, what are you dealing with? You're dealing with a total blind shot. That does not deserve a lot of your time. And people sometimes slave over these things because they think they look like such good fits on paper. I said, don't slave over it. That will definitely be trash. You don't even know who it's going to. But make the resume as strong as possible. So you said earlier that many job seekers put special information in the letter, uh, something, that, something that might not be appropriate on the resume. And I'm sure people are wondering, well, what wouldn't be appropriate? Why wouldn't it be appropriate? And why would it be appropriate in a cover letter? So could you give well, this case, for example, I have a person, big software firm, and he's contacting a, a, in a, a almost a direct competitor. You know, he's been in this business. He's known in the industry. And because of the sensitive nature of the fact that he, it's him and, and, uh, and the competitor and, uh, you know, they, they know each other indirectly, right, as competitors, he needs to address a little bit of that in the cover letter. This is very specific to that one company, and he's trying to defuse or preempt some questions, like why are you leaving your employer? Uh, why are you contacting us? Are you uh, in trouble? Uh, you know, in other words, this is this is not just to some ordinary company. This is to a, like a competitor, so that needs some special treatment, and you don't want any of that in the resume. The relocation issue might be a... Uh, I'll make it up. Citizenship, you know, something like this. May need some explanation that doesn't go on the resume, and you need needs, needs a little special handling. There's not really very much because if someone says, "Well, I have this extra special, super strong material. I'm going to save this for the cover letter." I say, "You better not. You better put that in the resume." He goes, "You don't know what, where that cover letter is going to go." That's what I mean. I would say special. Um, Special pleading, special information, maybe, for the cover letter. Yeah, and one thing that, that you did mention uh, as far as special information that obviously you wouldn't put on your resume is um, geographic. So let's say you were trying to relocate to another area. And yeah. how would you word that on a cover letter? You know what? Um, I'll tell you something. Nowadays, I know exactly what you mean. And say, so how do I tell them that I'm willing to relocate, you know, to Timbuktu? <laughs> To get, you know, all the way up. I said, you know what? Nowadays, the best way to handle that issue is to look local on the resume. It's a little bit sneaky. Look, in my opinion, if you, I deal with, I, half my clients are overseas, international, outside North America. You're in Singapore, you know, and you've been out there for a while. You're eager to move back to the United States. I said, don't put Singapore. Anywhere. <laughs> Don't put it on the letter. Don't, I mean, if you have the mobility to move, and if you can finance your own, you can fly to California and interview with companies there, get yourself a UPS mailbox or a relative or find, get a U.S. address that looks local. Put that right on the resume. That will preempt all the questions. And it's your job to show up and to relocate yourself if they say, if they're interested. Nothing better. You don't want to get into that question. Well, you know, we have um, five excellent candidates here. Now, you're great, but, you know, you're in Singapore. We don't really need this logistical uh, hurdle from you. No. Show them that you're right there in California with everybody else. Let's say that you do that. You're somebody who's working in Singapore. You're looking for a position in California. You put uh, a P.O. box or, 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 you know, one of the UPS stores, so it's not really obvious that it's a P.O. box. Actually, you know box. what? You know, no, you know what I would do? I don't even put it, I don't, for anybody, I don't even put addresses on these resumes anymore. I put a right. city, a state, and a zip code. Because so often a zip code is, ser is searchable by recruiters and whoever. That's all. That's all they get. Newport Beach, California. 
and that assumes you can, you know, finance this yourself. If you can't, well, then you're in there, and I do your best for a disclaimer. At the, it's really tough. I might have a disclaimer at the top. You know, well, um, eager, oh, I've done it. You know, old discussion about willing to relocate and whatever. Just don't get into it. Nobody is ever going to send you a snail mail. Anyway, <clears throat> it's going to be an email, maybe a phone, and just, just look local. So we were saying before that uh, many people will do both. They'll send by email, they'll also send by snail mail. What do you think is the best way to get that resume in the hands that it needs to get into? Do, do you recommend think, email, regular mail, both, or, or any other uh, possible way for it to get there? Yeah, it all depends on how important it is to you. You might have something, that, well, like the candidate I'm working with now, this is really important, wants to get to this other uh, company as a competitor, uh, it would be a very good fit, and it would give him something he can't get in his current place. This is his best shot. And I said, no. He, he right away, he's just going to send an email to HR. I said, no. That'll know. That's the worst thing you could do. So we did, a, we did the regular route, uploaded it into their system, and then it took a lot of research. This is the key. You have to research and find out who this this letter, this physical snail mail or DHL, whatever, wherever you're sending it, who should get this? And it should be, you know, reasonably high up, but not the like the CEO of the company, because you don't know exactly. But uh, it has to be close. As I said, it will never be thrown out. But it takes research, and that is tough finding out who and where and where they live physically. This takes, and he's if you're in sales, you know, this is more of a natural kind of a uh, challenge people deal with. But that is the key, finding out who and where they live. Okay, now just, just to clarify, so when you're saying where they live, you mean actually where they live or the company itself? Oh, the company. I mean, in other words, you know, it's tough. I mean, companies are all over. Somebody can be the official table of where everybody and the, the top executives of the company, right? He may look like he's in in uh, Los Angeles, in Japan somewhere, right. for, for whatever internal reason. And it's important to know that. And it happens a lot. The people are very mobile. And you can't literally, you know, maybe often you can, but not always, go by like what's on the official website. You would like to know. You may find out the person is not really there. And as I said, if you send it in an official-looking medium, like FedEx or Priority Mail, it will, in my experience, these things do get through. They are forwarded. But you want to get as close as you can. And, you, you know, I say it's, that is, yeah. I believe, is the hardest thing, is getting that kind of information. Yeah, it's really, uh, really tough today because so many people do work either at satellite offices or home-based offices, um, you know, and they yeah, work virtually, sure. that it's really uh, difficult to make sure that, um, you know, it, if you're sending it to the headquarters, you, it, there could be a long time before it actually gets in in the hands of the person that you're trying to reach. That's why I said it has to look important. It cannot look like junk mail. Cannot look like uh, something unsolicited. If it looks important, you know, it'll get there. But I'm saying you don't do this every time you send out your resume. This is a high priority shot. You know, you may only have a few of these. It's the extra uh, time, expense, research into it. But it really does pay off. People don't do it. I, actually, this whole, this whole, what I'm describing here is, is relatively rarely done. People don't do it. Or, I mean, I'll tell, lay out the whole scenario, and they will do it. And then this, at my expense and everything else, they'll put it in a number 10 envelope. <laughs> I say, you know, that was the whole point, you know, was to send it in something more official. But... So when creating a cover letter, uh, what are your thoughts about using graphics or, or pictures on cover letters and resume? I do see, I do well, see that a lot. Hold it a minute. Part one has ended. Please click part two to continue.